How often do you look back? How often do you take the time to remember what it was like to be a preteen with the whole world in front of you? Were you idealistic? Were you lonely? Did you have big dreams or did you feel like you had to grow up too quickly? Do you even remember what it was like back then? And if you do, do you ever just marvel at how much your life and your perception of reality has so fundamentally changed from those seemingly innocent years? If you could speak to your younger self now, what do you think you can learn from you? What do you think you can learn from them? Is any age group ever truly innocent or ever fully grounded? Is there something that can be learned from all stages of life, no matter your age? Well, if you haven't gone down this existential rabbit hole recently, I invite you to do so now as you dive into the topic of today's editorial, Paper Girls, written by Brian K. Vaughn with art by Cliff Chang and color by Matt Wilson. Hope saying that right. Paper Girls stars four 12-year-old girls in 1988 named Mac, KJ, Tiffany, and Aaron, who are, as the title implies, Paper Girls. Mac is a chain-smoking, foul-mouthed, and openly homophobic tomboy who is the first paper girl in her hometown of Stony Creek. KJ is the brains of the operation who attends a Jewish private school named Buttonwood Academy where she plays field hockey and carries a field hockey stick around with her at all times as a result. Tiffany is an obsessive gamer with equal love for her walkie-talkies, as well as the adoptive daughter to a mixed-race family. And lastly, Erin just recently moved to Stony Stream and is thus the newest addition to the crew. She tends to play more by the rules and is often hesitant to rock the boat when the situation calls for it at the start of the story. She's also our main POV character through the book's first couple volumes. Anyway, our story begins when Erin goes out on her paper route in the morning of November 1st, or Hell Morning as she affectionately calls it, and is quickly harassed by a group of teenagers vandalizing the neighborhood. She is saved when our three other protagonists intervene, and Mac lets Erin join their group. They decide to split off into pairs to cover more ground, with KJ and Tiffany going one way and Mac and Erin going the other. But Tiff gives them one of her walkie-talkies so they can keep in touch. Things get weird very quickly after that, as Mac receives word from their walkie-talkie that KJ and Tiff are in trouble, so her and Aaron race off to find them. Upon arrival, they explain that they got jumped by three mysterious men wearing bad ghost costumes, who were speaking a language none of them understood. They further elaborate that these mysterious assailants stole Tiff's walkie-talkie, which means I can hopefully stop saying walkie-talkie. The four head off to pursue them, eventually taking them to a nearby unfinished house, where they find a very alien-looking device in the basement. While they were messing with it, as you do, they accidentally activate it, which seems to zap them with something and causes nearby light sources to either short out or pop like balloons. This causes the group to run outside to see that things are clearly different, as a night sky is turned into astrologist screensaver. But they don't have much time to dwell on this before seeing the three assailants they've been pursuing a short distance away. KJ is the first to reach them as they make a run for it, but is quickly knocked back. This causes Mac to lash out and tackles one of them, taking off his mask. What is revealed, however, is too much for Mac to handle, as her adversary appears to be a severely disfigured man with all kinds of wiring and metal seemingly built into his head. Using the distraction to her advantage, Tiff quickly knocks the man on the head with KJ's field hockey stick, causing a retreat into the woods. Things only get stranger, though, as shortly after the attacker flees, KJ finds the mysterious device lying on the ground that appears to have the Apple logo printed on it, a logo that was only on computers in the 80s. The kids retreat to Aaron's house, where they're finally allowed an opportunity to regroup and figure out just what the hell is going on. They quickly seem to ascertain that a lot of the adults seem to be missing and the phone lines are down, which is around the time they decide they should head over to Mac's place to get a gun. Along the way, Aaron starts to piece together that maybe they're being invaded by time travelers. You know, like from Star Trek IV, the best Star Trek movie, don't at me. But just as KJ dismisses the idea as ridiculous, She's kind of given instant confirmation for her theory as this guy opens up to unleash a flock of huge pterodactyls. They race off to Mac's house from there and try to find her gun, but only find Mac's mom instead, incredibly drunk and claiming that her husband just vanished into thin air. She subsequently tries to shoot herself, but Mac intervenes, accidentally shooting Aaron instead. Mac rushes to Aaron's side to help assess the damage and discover upon turning around that her mom has also seemingly disappeared without a trace. Not knowing what else to do, they all pile into Mac's station wagon to try to race off to the hospital. All on the way, however, a mysterious voice comes over the walkie-talkie, speaking some form of broken English. While they're pondering exactly who this is and what they're trying to say, they look back on the road and discover that he's standing right in front of them, dressed in shiny armor waving a rather threatening sci-fi stick. The group stops the car and gets out as a mysterious man continues to threaten them in his broken English. 
but when he hears them speak, he realizes they're locals and puts on some kind of translator that allows him to speak their dialect. While he assures them that he'll take care of their wounded friend and make sure they don't remember any of this, he is suddenly shot in the head by the other mysterious group of the evening, the assailants from earlier. Except this time, they seem to come in peace, as one of them grabs a translator from the Asgard looking dude and says that the old timer wouldn't have helped them. It's at this point that these cloaked individuals reveal themselves to actually be teenagers. But it looks like more trouble is looming as another one of the old timers discovers the body of her comrade and makes a call to an old man called simply Grandfather, who seems to be the man in charge. While lazily waking up, he instructs her to release an editrix to track them down. Meanwhile, down the sewers, our heroes are following the teenagers, who identify themselves as Heck and Naldo, to a machine that can heal Eren. They confirm that they are indeed time travelers, and a third among them was Heck's boyfriend before he was killed by the old timer. Mac asks why they can't just go back and save him, to which Heck replies, Your ending is your ending, no matter what. Before they can answer more of our heroes' questions, however, they are interrupted by the Editrix, a strange being that looks like a radioactive testicle with eyes at the end of its hairs. It manages to wrap one of its tentacles around Tiff, which apparently forced her to relive her life. And what she saw... is just kind of depressing, as she spends a good chunk of her life getting really good at... what I can only guess is... Brick Break? Brick Breaker? Either way, not exactly an eventful life, and Tiff agrees. The teenagers manage to kill the beast, leading them into the forest and back to their time machine. The teenager motions them to stay as they take Aaron to the machine and disappear. And so at this point, they realize they fucked up. But true to their word, the teenagers take her back to their warehouse where they patch her up and prepare to take her back home. All while explaining that they are scavengers, not thieves, at least by their own definition. Just as they're about to put in the coordinates, however, the teenagers are intercepted by the old timers who attempt to ground them. They managed to make it back to the basement the girls found the ship originally, but the teenagers didn't survive the trip. Luckily for Aaron, the rest of the gang figured out where she would be and meet her there. Unluckily, they weren't the only ones, as Grandfather has found them and is waiting outside the house. He orders them to listen to their elders and come outside this instant, claiming that the teenagers they met aren't the Robin Hoods they claim to be, but rather just a murderous gang of thugs. Apparently, according to Grandfather, the girls have found themselves in some kind of ongoing generational conflict. While the girls debate what to do, the time machine goes off once again, flaying them all into the future, separating them from KJ and immediately running to Aaron's older self. Yeah, that's just volume one, guys. That, that, that was all just set up. Don't worry, we're not going to go through each volume. I know you guys have lives. I just wanted to properly set the stage. And the rest of the story is a time-traveling war between three main factions. The old-timers, the teenagers, and our 12-year-old girl stuck right in the middle. They hop from time period to time period trying to make their way home, while also trying to understand the kind of world they're going to grow into and the people they will become. As the war progresses and we get to spend time with each faction and the sub-factions that would develop, we eventually learn that the real cause of the war is not, in fact, about how to use time travel as the book states, but it's actually about each side's failure in intergenerational communication. To really examine why, let's take a look at each faction, starting with the old-timers. The old-timers, as the name implies, are comprised of members of the older generation, more specifically, the generation that immediately preceded the invention of time travel. As such, they take time travel very seriously and adhere to a strict set of rules and regulations designed to preserve the time stream at all costs. This includes, but is not limited to, never allowing themselves to travel to their own future and race in the minds of anyone in the time period they're visiting who sees something they shouldn't. This is done by a subsection of the old-timers called the Restorers, aka the people dressed in the rejected destiny armor. Indeed. They are all led by Grandfather, who is much older than everyone under his command. Much, much older as a matter of fact, as the book reveals that he's actually a refugee from the year 11,706 BC, who was brought to the future as a baby by the first time traveler along with her mother. It it's a long story, we're not going to go into it. As such, he's the only one among the people he leads who still dresses in 20, 21st century clothes and speaks in the same dialect of our modern day. Every one of his younger counterparts all speak a different form of English that Grandfather refers to as Slanguage, which he doesn't seem to have much interest in understanding. He instead asks everyone who speaks to him to use a translator to speak his particular dialect. The faction also contains a surprising amount of religious terminology and iconography. For one thing, the central craft they use to traverse time and space is called the Cathedral, with many of their higher-ranking officials being called Cardinals. In a room presumably only allowed access to by Grandfather lies a seemingly imprisoned editrix, possibly representing some kind of spiritual deity. 
Grandfather seems convinced that he was chosen by these fourth dimensional beings to be their leader, and he believes that means time is on their side as a result. We'll talk more about Grandfather in a little bit. The teenagers, on the other hand, are a much angrier bunch, but for a fairly justifiable reason. The teenagers are the generation that followed the generation that discovered time travel, and thus not only inherited their major advantages, but also their greatest mistakes. And in this case, they're kind of the same thing. By the time the teenagers are born, their forefathers have already decided that time traveling was an immoral act, and had the aforementioned strict rules to prevent history from being changed. The teenagers, however, believe that every generation should be able to live in the best possible present, and see time travel as a means to achieve this. So while the old-timers want to maintain the status quo at all costs, the teenagers are advocating for fundamental changes in history to ensure a better future. Failing that, their secondary goal is to steal technology from the past so that future generations might use them to make a better future. They even use clones of our protagonists to further their goals by any means necessary. These clones were made because our protagonists are apparently destined to change the fate of the war, a theory that would turn out to be correct. But while the teenagers come with noble intentions, it leads to deadly consequences. Because while the old-timers use time travel with care and deliberation, teenagers are much more reckless with the technology, and don't have the same rules the old-timers do. As a result, almost all teenagers in this war suffer from a rare form of incurable cancer that only affects time travelers, leading to their misshapen nature. Despite the fatality that their actions are destined to cause, they push on regardless, because in their mind, death is worth it if it means the future doesn't need to suffer from the stakes of the past. Naturally, it's this ideological difference that leads to ultimate conflict, with both sides actively demonizing the other. The old-timers often refer to the teenagers as kids, delinquents, terrorists, vandals, psychopaths, what have you, while the teenagers angrily lament how the old-timers have forced them down a path they never had a voice in and refused to change. Neither side is completely right, as both have major flaws in their arguments. However, both sides could have benefited from the other, as neither side is completely wrong either. It is in the nature of teenagers to rebel against authority, push the boundaries of society, and even point out injustices that have long been ignored. Yeah, seriously, we really don't give this age group enough credit. But on the other hand, it is the role of adults, in the most idealistic case, to help guide this younger generation on how to apply the ideological nature to the world at large, to teach them the rules of reality that can make their ideals possible. Because adults can teach teenagers the lessons they've learned through time and experience on how the world works, while teenagers can teach adults just how the world has changed from the one they knew. But if neither side is willing to listen to the other and just dismisses what they're saying out of hand, then all you're left with is conflict. And this is represented in Paper Girls as the younger generation literally speaking languages the older can't understand or isn't willing to try. Grandfather speaks most traditional English, while his young adult to middle-aged contemporaries all speak from a slang that he has no interest in trying to understand. He even calls the woman he loved in his younger days a child for daring to tease him about it. And the teenagers speak a language that is all but unintelligible to anyone except their own. Neither side is willing to communicate to the other. Therefore, nobody benefits. So where does that leave our third faction in this war? Our protagonists. Four girls stuck in the middle of a conflict they only barely understand and mostly want no part of. Well, they're given a very unique perspective on the whole affair because they're not only in that stage of life where the decisions you make start to actively define who you will become, but also because they run into future versions of themselves in very different stages of their life. As a result, they get a first-hand glimpse in just how much they will drastically and even disappointingly change as they get older. Aaron is the first to meet her older self in 2016. This Aaron is in her 40s, still lives in Stony Stream, and works for the local newspaper. She suffers from an anxiety disorder which she takes pills for and has no husband or children. Older Aaron is naturally a little freaked out by the whole affair, and her first instinct is to protect these kids from the dangerous situation they found themselves in. Young Aaron, on the other hand, thinks that something has gone terribly wrong, and fights her future self to honestly be kind of pathetic. But the more time they spend together, the more they begin to see each other as equals, with just very different perspectives, and as such, actually learn something from one another. Older Erin gets to see her life through young eyes and recognize that she can still be brave in a terrifying world, and young Erin actually listens to some of the wisdom old Erin has to share. The world is a terrifying place, more than I ever realized. But if I had my whole life to do over again, that's literally the only thing I'd change. I'd stop being so afraid of other people. Tiff has a similar experience, but unlike Erin, her future self is going through a transitionary period of her own. 
The older TIFF we're introduced to is in her early 20s, and let's face it, people in their early 20s are just slightly older teenagers, at the literal start of the new millennium at the peak of the Y2K hysteria. To say that TIFF's older counterpart is not what she was expecting is a massive understatement, as she is rocking some hardcore punk goth clothing and is married to a man she met in college rocking his best Alice Cooper cosplay. And unlike older Aaron, who has more or less accepted her lot in life, older TIFF is still very much trying to figure her shit out. That being said, she accepts younger Tiff as an equal almost immediately, likely because they have that in common. And also unlike older Aaron, who decides to stay in her time period to help other people out, older Tiff wants to go with her younger self to see if maybe she can change some of history's tragedies. This eventually culminates in older Tiff sacrificing herself to save the group, only to be saved in the last minute by a new faction of the war I'm going to call the Committee, although they're not given a name in the book. Tiff discovers this mysterious group after a time bomb detonated by a clone of Eren, while well in story, causes the four to separate into different time periods. Tiff ends up in the future, where the war is finally over, and she's discovered by a different clone of Eren. Yeah, there are a lot of clones here. Clone Eren introduces her to the committee, who says that she is the key to ending the war once and for all. On that committee is the aforementioned clone Eren, a 19-year-old clone Eren, a middle-aged clone of KJ, and a much older original Tiff who has spent the last 60 years working with various generations to build the tools they would need to end the war that has already ended in their time. And they're ultimately successful, as they bring the girls back to the original time and convince Grandfather to come with them for one final negotiation. Their terms are a simple ceasefire. If the old-timers stop using time travel, so will they. Grandfather protests because it would basically mean giving up their way of life. That is, until an editrix cuts a hold of him and shows him his life story, and in doing so makes him realize that everything he believed and everything he thought his world and existence meant was a lie. He realizes the power he thought was rightfully theirs to use, as long as they were careful, wasn't theirs at all. It isn't anyone's. And continuing to fight over it is hurting everyone. So he agrees to their terms, and the war is over. All because different generations got together, spoke on the same terms, and actually had hope for the future. And it's this committee that ultimately represents Paper Girl's answer to the book's central question. How do you resolve the conflicts that come from failing to communicate between generations? Simple. You never stop listening to what other generations have to offer. The reason the committee succeeds is because each of its members represents a different age group, from preteens to old age and each treats the others with equal amounts of respect where their voice is given equal weight. There is no leader, there's no seniority, there's no entitlement to respect. They share the same goal, and they allow proper cooperation without condescension. The committee represents an ideal, an ideal that could be reached if each generation learns how to communicate with each other without looking down on them and see what they have to offer. That's not to say that's easy by any stretch of the imagination, and Paper Girls doesn't shy away from showing just how drastically people change as they get older. That's normal, that's natural. But the way you look at the world also tends to change how you look at people younger than you. And that's because the older we get and the more we learn about the world and ourselves, the more we are given the gift that comes to guide our decisions through a lot of our adulthoods. Perspective. Meaning we now have the ability of hindsight to recognize the mistakes we've made as well as the scope of our actions. This allows us not only learn from the mistakes of the past and prevent them from happening again, but also recognize how small some of these mistakes, as well as other drama we've experienced, actually were in the grand scheme of things. The more experienced we become, the more we can add to our overall worldview. Or to put it in simpler terms, by the time we reach adulthood, we have the perspective to recognize what events in our lives actually mattered and what stuff we can let go. There are two main fallacies with perspective, however, like sneak up on you for not being careful. One, perspective can convince you that you're at your wisest and there's nothing else to learn, and two, it can convince you that the younger generation's beliefs are inferior because they just don't know any better. Which can result in a lot of condescension, intentional or otherwise. So let's tackle the first fallacy. As we've mentioned previously, people get more perspective as they learn from unique experiences, and thus establish a worldview based on those experiences. However, some people, especially as they approach old age, seem to believe that their worldview is definite that their perspective on how society works and how people function is absolute. They've learned all they can in the world, and now it's their job to impart that wisdom onto the younger generation, or lament how the younger people just don't see things the way they do. But in truth, none of this perspective is wisdom. It's an inflexible arrogance. It's the belief that they've learned all they can and are now the masters of their own knowledge. 
and believing as such completely ignores the fact that we, as human beings, are meant to continuously learn. From the day we're born to the day we die, our brains never stop absorbing new information. And new information is always readily available because the world is always changing. If older generations close themselves off from that and dismiss it out of hand, then they miss the opportunity to actually become wiser, to actually become the person they claim to be. Now granted, there's another side of this where older individuals think very poorly of themselves and resist learning new things because they don't feel like they're capable of learning it. Alternatively, there are people who have just given up and becoming stagnant, deciding never to learn and grow ever, but that's a topic for another day. And of course, this fallacy also feeds into the other. Because if you believe that your perspective has taught you everything there is to know about the world from your viewpoint, then it's easy to dismiss the viewpoints of those younger than you as simple-minded or ignorant, liking them to children and believing that they'll see things your way with time and more experience. And this belief isn't exclusive to seniors. It can really apply to anyone as they progress into adulthood. Hell, I've been guilty of this too. And that's an incredibly dismissive and condescending viewpoint and puts you up on an intellectual and moral high ground that doesn't really exist. But more importantly, it's so damaging to the discourse to discredit the lived experience of those younger than you simply because they're younger, ignoring the fact that they likely have all kinds of lessons to teach as well. While the perspective of adulthood has all kinds of lessons to give to the younger generation, it's all too easy to fall into these fallacies and close yourself off from learning, which leads to these failures to communicate. Because we see our adult selves as superiors rather than as teachers, then the people of the younger generation who are supposed to be our students instead become our adversaries. But if we, as adults, can maintain a teacher-student relationship with the younger generation, then both groups learn from the other as they're meant to. Teenagers, on the other hand, are at a much different phase of their development than their adult peers. Teenagers, in general, tend to get a pretty bad rep in popular culture, often portrayed as angry hormonal punks who are incredibly reckless and shouldn't be taken seriously. But I've always thought this viewpoint is more than a little reductive, because there is often a biological and psychological component that often gets overlooked. Biologically, the teenage years are a time when they're extremely hormonal and emotional because your brain is running way beyond capacity and processing things at a level they've never experienced before. Which basically means they feel very intensely because their brain is telling them that everything is intense. But more importantly, psychologically, the teenage years are the first time in their life, on average, when you begin to realize that not everything is right with the world. And you begin to realize how unfair it is and the degrees to which that unfairness lies. They begin to see how complicated the world is beyond the safety net provided during their childhood. You trusted your caretakers as the holders of all knowledge. But as you get older, you only begin to realize they don't actually know everything either, but the things they've been teaching you might not even be true. And that means at some point during your teenage years, your fundamental beliefs are going to be challenged in some way. And the decision that comes from that challenge forever shapes you into the person you'll ultimately become. This is also why so many teenagers engage in a lot of reckless behavior. It's not only lacking the perspective to predict consequences, but it's also a generation testing the boundaries of a world they're only just now beginning to understand. And in all honesty, saying this period stops after your teenage years is being pretty generous. The brain doesn't actually stop growing until you turn 25. So we have a brain telling you everything needs to be felt at 150% and a reality that's slowly breaking through the shield of childhood innocence. Who wouldn't be angry about that? Is it any surprise that people who are only now starting to become who they're going to be when we rebel against a system that, by and large, looks down on them? And moreover, in living in a society that predominantly looks down on them, the perspective that teenagers can actually provide is often overlooked or dismissed. Because while they are often labeled as reckless or naive, they are consciously and unconsciously aware of the changes caused by their adult peers to their world and society. Changes that they have no control over or have any voice in. So many of them choose to speak up about the issues that plague them, about the cruelty and injustice that our society frequently commits. They try to promote an ideology that should be a no-brainer, but can get so caught up in the political and financial ramifications that is often swept under the rug whenever possible. Just as a couple easy examples, hey, maybe it's a good idea to enact some gun laws so I don't have to be terrified to go to school. Or, hey, maybe we should actually do something to prevent the world from dying of climate change. You know, the world will inevitably inherit, but it's actively suffering from your mistakes. They are a passionate and active voice in our community, but often the first to be disregarded due to their age. As a result, it can often lead to many teenagers, and young adults for that matter, to dismiss people older than them in kind, saying that they're just out of touch and refusing to acknowledge how things have changed. And thus it all becomes a destructive cycle, 
where adults feel like those younger than them won't listen to the wisdom they feel they can share, and teenagers feel unheard and disregarded, so will rebel and disregard any guidance in kind. That being said, they are still young, and while we, as adults, can learn a lot about the way the world has changed through their eyes, they still have a lot to learn about how our world and society works in general. So both groups play a role in how the other develops, and the adult's job should always be to guide, not direct. It's a teenager's job to decide where they want to go and how far they want to push their ideology. It's not our job to take that away from them, but to give them the tools they need to survive, thrive, and maybe even change the world, hopefully for the better. There's no guarantee that they'll listen or that we'll agree with everything they say, but it's at this crucial stage of growing into adulthood where it's important to start treating them more like adults and give them the space to learn and make mistakes that will grant them their own perspective. Which of course leads us to the youngest generation in our discussion, the preteens. Now the age of 11 to 12 is a very awkward time in our development, and also the most malleable. This age is really the first time we become aware of our own agency, our own independence, that we're allowed to create personalities that differentiate from what we've been told, where we begin to become aware of more complex topics that we spend years figuring out. Things like sexuality, gender identity, ideology, uh, personal or religious beliefs, or just a few difficult topics we have to navigate during this time but we don't quite have the context to put all those pieces together. As such, more than any other demographic, this is the group probably most susceptible to learning either consciously or unconsciously from their peers and environment. And because they're looking at this from fresh eyes, we'll also be the group to, perhaps unintentionally, challenge our preconceived notions on how the world functions. Which is why I think Brian Vaughn chose to make these four girls the focal point for this conflict because they are in a position to actively learn from and challenge both sides, and they push both to their limits. Because while it's easy to dismiss this age group as children, as pretty much everyone does in Paper Girls, that's often to their detriment, because these girls are a lot smarter and a lot more observant than anyone gives them proper credit for. As such, to disregard what they have to say without due consideration is not only missing an opportunity to help them understand the world in their own way, but also misses the opportunity to have our own beliefs on the world challenged by those starting to ask hard questions about it. And everyone who actually makes an attempt to listen to our heroes and paper girls often ends up respecting them as well as learn from each other. While those who don't are often the ones who can't understand anyone except those who are already on their side. And that's what makes listening to preteens so important. They are in the greatest position to learn from what you have to say but they will question you the entire way, and that's a good thing. We need to be challenged on what we believe and to challenge ourselves to answer the difficult questions these kids will ask. Because they're not stupid. They're learning, and they're learning quickly. That needs to be treated with respect and not talked down to. These are kids who are developing their agency bit by bit every day, and many of them know when they're being talked down to. They're smart enough to know when they aren't being taken seriously, and at that crucial age, they want to be taken seriously. They want their questions and their observations taken with honesty because they want to be more prepared for what life has to offer. Like the teenagers they will soon become, they want to be seen, heard, understood, and respected. And it's the job of adults, parents, guardians, what have you, to see them and listen. And that brings us back to the committee. Four age groups, working together and succeeding in bringing about a better world because they are all teachers and students. And that's how we all need to see each other. No generation is perfect. No age group is perfect, but all can still contribute if you're willing to do so. But that requires that we all acknowledge that none of us know everything and that we can all learn from each other. And we need to if we want to become better. We all have a role to play and it's important that we all understand what that is, what it means, and how we can support each other rather than look down on the other. It is the role of adults and seniors to provide guidance, perspective, and support for those younger than them because they have the most experience. It is the role of teenagers and young adults to test the boundaries of what society will allow and teach the adults how the world is changing as well as how they need to change with it. It is the role of children and preteens to challenge their older peers on their own beliefs and to listen to the guidance those peers have to offer without fear of asking the difficult questions. All these roles are vital. They promote cooperation, listening, learning, and never becoming complacent in what you think you know. That is so important. Because if we become complacent in what we know, if we make the mistake of thinking we're done learning, that we know everything, or everyone older or younger is out of touch or naive, then you don't actually make a better world. You make it actively worse. You shut yourself off from the potential of the future. You shut yourself off from the gifts that other generations can give. 
That's not to say she listen to all people of all generations, as many have the worst intentions in mind. For more on that, see my mouse in Superman Smash the Clan editorials. But if we can learn to foster a relationship of cooperation with each generation, if we can get enough people from each to be open to being both teacher and student, our collective voice can drown out those who are too focused on being right. We can drown out the generation who would rather dismiss and decry anyone who doesn't fall in line with what they believe. We can finally move past all the angry people who would rather be right and divide and become the people who would do right and listen. Is this possibly overly idealistic? Probably. But what are our ideals for if not to fight for a better future? And we can all play a part in that if we're open to it. And that'll take time, and it'll be hard. Because we have to let go of so many preconceived notions of each other. But if we can pull it off, if we can give everyone the grounds to speak, challenge, and guide, then maybe, just maybe, we can create a future worth fighting for. A world where we all understand the language of growing up.